on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia series and our sponsor, RareSight, I'd like to welcome you to Resolving the Complexity of Tissue Immune Response with Orion High Dimensional Imaging. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today. He is Eric Kaljan, MD, Chief Medical Officer at RareSight Incorporated. Eric is a board-certified anatomic pathologist with subspecialty training in lymphoma at the National Cancer Institute. His industry experience spans discovery research, drug development, clinical genomics, and companion diagnostics. Welcome, Dr. Kaljian. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Hello and welcome to the seminar. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to discuss highly multiplex tissue imaging using the remarkable Orion platform. At RareSight, we've developed technology platforms for biomarker analysis and sequencing of rare circulating tumor cells in blood, and also for highly multiplex tissue imaging, which is the topic for today's webinar. Today, I will present to you image data that are derived from the Orion platform, which generates same-day whole slide images with subcellular imaging resolution in a single stain, single scan workflow with staining panels which are customizable. The panel that is used in this study has 17 markers that are pertinent to both immunology and immuno-oncology. First, a brief bit of background on the rationale for high-dimensional imaging of the tissue microenvironment. Tissues are complex, as you know. There are many types of cells and non-cellular components. Their composition and spatial location reflects host immune response, and in cancer has been associated with response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. It is difficult to impossible to determine cellular composition using traditional light microscopy. Here is a lymph node follicle stained by standard hematoxylin and eosin methods. And with the trained eye, one can see different morphologies of cells, but without molecular information, a definitive classification is challenging, uh, to say the least. Immunohistochemistry on serial sections gives a population view for any one cell marker, but complex phenotypes cannot really be resolved. Multiplex imaging allows identification of cell types and states within the spatial context of tissue architecture by the analysis of proteins expressed on the cells and the matrix components. Here's an example of how multiplex imaging can resolve cell types. So in this follicle, I have drawn arrows to indicate five different cells. What are these cells? By using multiplex stain on this same tissue section, the cell types can be determined. So for instance, if I stain with CD20 here in blue, I can see that cell 1 is in fact a B cell represented by that CD20 stain. If I stain with the macrophage marker CD68, I can see that cell number two is expressing that marker. Similarly, if I stain for CD4, in this case colored with red, I can see that cell number three is expressing CD4, and thus it's a CD4 helper T cell phenotype. On the other hand, Cell 4 is a cytotoxic T cell phenotype staining with CD8. And finally, cell 5 stains with the vascular endothelial marker CD31 and is actually part of a vessel that runs through that follicle. So multiplex imaging in this case has enabled us to see the actual identity of these five cells. What's more, because imaging of the markers is performed on the same section, we can identify cells with complex phenotypes. In this case, we can see that cells expressing the checkpoint and exhaustion marker PD1 
in green are in fact CD4 positive T cells, which are in red. So here are those cells in question, CD1 positivity here, CD4 positivity here. So high-dimensional protein imaging has tremendous potential for understanding tissue and microenvironments. An ideal platform would have a variety of attributes. One would be sufficient flex depth. Um, and here, uh, the reason for this is to be able to expand the cell phenotyping and biomarker analysis. And in general, if this could be over 10 biomarkers, that would be a significant step up from the current immunofluorescence, which hovers between five, six, maybe seven. The resolution should be sufficient to be able to assess subcellular compartments, membrane cytoplasm, and nucleus. The image area ideally would cover the entire tissue section rather than just isolated regions so that one could get the full complement of information available on that slide. Staining should keep epitopes intact so one can generate reliable data. The scanning should be rapid so that one can have a practical analysis of tissues within the laboratory. And finally, the ideal system should be able to handle various sample types, whether it's fresh frozen or whether it's paraffin embedded or slide smears. So we have designed Orion with these attributes in mind. Um, the plex depth that we have for Orion is up to 20 biomarkers. Its resolution is, in fact, subcellular. It performs whole slide imaging. We use a single cycle staining process and a single step scanning process, which is less than three hours for the slide and could be considerably less depending on the size of the tissue section. And finally, it is sample type agnostic. What we will be showing you here in this seminar is formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues. Now I'm sure uh, you have some questions as to how this can be done. Um, traditional fluorescence imaging, as you know, uses a single dye in each spectral region um, of the uh, light spectrum, and um, that, generally speaking, allows for five or six um, markers to be viewed at a time. What Orion technology does is, in fact, extracts specific signals from closely adjacent dyes which allows multiple markers per spectral region to be um, assessed. So here's an example of the resolution of overlapping signals. Um, this section of lung has been stained with five antibodies with dyes all from the orange region of the spectrum. You see that on the left. This is what it looks like if this had been imaged with a traditional fluorescence imaging system because the markers are so close together within the spectrum, it's really difficult to separate those signals, and they all come out as if it were one signal. Orion resolved these signals so that individual biomarkers can be visualized. You can see that resolution in the center of CD68, cytokeratin, CD4, FOXB3, and CD8. And then on the right, you can see the pseudocolor results of all of these cells together within that section of lung. All of a sudden, that complexity becomes resolved. And what's more, we have this within a single spectral region. You multiply this across several spectral regions, and you increase the plex depth. Before we discuss the study for today, a brief word on uh, biomarker panel validation. Antibodies used in the multiplex panel that we will show and in all of our multiplex panels are tested against gold standard single colored IHC to verify the accuracy of staining. Here are a few examples showing similar staining results between multiplex fluorescence and immunohistochemistry. So at the top, you see E. cathirin in the middle, CD31 staining blood vessels. The E. cathirin is staining epithelial cells within the tonsil. And the bottom, you're seeing a follicle proliferating KI67 immunofluorescence on the left using Orion and IHC on the right. So with that 
as the introduction, now I'd like to present a comparative investigation of lymphoid tissues by Orion High Dimensional Imaging. There are three tissues used in this study, representing three different conditions. First, non-stimulated lymphoid tissues are represented by a quiescent lymph node. Reactive immune response is represented by a hyperplastic tonsil. And finally, malignancy is represented by small lymphocytic lymphoma, the tissue counterpart of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. A 17-flex panel was used to investigate the tissues. The markers are listed here and cover biomarkers that are pertinent to immunology, immuno-oncology. They include the leukocyte marker CD45, B cell marker CD20, the T cell markers CD3, CD4, and CD8, the T regulatory cell marker FOXP3, the macrophage dendritic cell markers CD68 and CD163, uh, CD45RO, a marker of activated lymphocytes, the checkpoint markers PD1 and PDL1, the endothelial uh, cell marker CD31, the epithelial cell markers cytokeratin and E cadherin, the proliferating cell markers PCNA and KI67, and finally, a nuclear dye, Cytox Blue. So in this study, I will present both qualitative and quantitative analysis of the image data. To begin, qualitative investigation. And I'd like to point out that the images that I'm going to be showing you of immunofluorescence are subsets of images of the entire 17-flex set. All the markers have been simultaneously imaged, but our human vision cannot comprehend all of them at once. So you'll see them in sets of four, five, and six. So let's start with lymph node. Here's a whole slide image of um, an H&E section of lymph node. It shows the entire section with a capsule um, around the edge and then the lymphoid tissue within. The lymphoid tissues are generally divided into the B cell zones, which are follicles. You can see those in blue with CD20 at a very high altitude here. And the T cell zones, which you can see represented by the CD4 a subset of T cells in magenta. Um, there are also scattered um, macrophages that you can see in yellow throughout. At higher magnification, you can more easily see the B cell follicles in blue, the CD4 positive T cells in the interfollicular areas primarily, the CD68 positive macrophages in magenta that are collected um, within the T cell regions and we'll see other regions as well. And finally, the CD31 positive blood vessels that are present um, within the T cell regions. At still higher power, we can see even more detail. We can see that there are a few red PCNA positive cells within the follicle. These are proliferating cells that um, um, are part of the B cell um, response to antigens. Um, the blood vessels are more prominent here. You can see that there are very few cells between them. They look quite compact together within the T cell zone. Activation states can also be assessed by using markers of cellular physiology, as we mentioned. In this case, we have two different markers of proliferation, both PCNA in red and also KI67 in green. There are relatively few proliferating cells that you see here, and these ones are um, confined to B cells they're not present within the T cells, um, which are here in magenta. PD1 
the checkpoint exhaustion marker is also present. You can see that in the uh, light blue color here. T cells, as you know, have various subsets. Here, this slide is showing the CD4 and the CD8 subsets in um, the uh, cyan color and magenta, how they are interspersed within this T cell zone. And moreover, we can look at the T regulatory subset, FOXP3, which is a nuclear marker, and you can see that in red in a few scattered cells throughout. These cells are CD4 positive cells, not CD8 positive cells. And finally, within the lymph node, we have macrophage subsets. Within a follicle, you can see these dispersed macrophages, CD68 positive cells in yellow. Many of these cells are expressing PDL1, the checkpoint marker and target of uh, various drugs, which is in red. And CD163, an M2 macrophage marker, is prominent in the extrafollicular region here. Many of these cells also co-express CD68. The background of this follicle in the white color are the CD20 B cells. So now let's take a look at reactive hyperplasia within the tonsil. This whole slide image of the tonsil shows its general architecture. There's a mucosal surface at the top lined by epithelium, and there are the tonsillar crypts, which are the infoldings of the tissue, uh, and within that are the lymphoid regions um, underneath. The architecture is very clearly seen when you stain with immunofluorescence. Um, cytokeratin and e cadherin are two epithelial markers which mark the mucosal surface and very neatly mark the crypts that are present within the folds of the tonsil. Um, the uh, T cell zones are in white, um, stained by CD4, and the B cell follicles are in blue. We'll go at higher power to see this in more detail. So this magnification shows uh, B cell follicles that are considerably expanded from what we saw on the lymph node. The B cells here are marked by CD20 in blue. Um, the, within the follicles, you see many PCNA positive cells showing the proliferation of the germinal centers within this reactive uh, lymphoid tissue. Uh, CD4 positive cells are uh, in yellow, they're present in the intrafollicular T cell zones, um, some areas of dense expansion, and we can see some high endothelial venules marked very clearly with CD31. Um, the next slide shows an even higher power magnification of this follicle. And once again, we see the uh, tremendous uh, proliferation of the germinal center region. We also can see macrophages interspersed in magenta, a little difficult to discriminate from the red of PCNA, but still um, possible to see. And uh, once again, we have the T cells in yellow, and we've got the red, the um, vessels in green here, the CD31 positive vessels. Interestingly enough, in the tonsil, we have uh, KI67 positive and PCNA positive proliferating cells within the germinal center. Um, these are two different markers of cell cycle, and uh, generally speaking here, most of the cells are expressing both of them. The T cells, again, we see in the outer region of the, outside the follicle primarily, and then PD1 cells, the checkpoint exhaustion marker, are present in blue scattered throughout this follicle. And as you can see, these blue cells are not proliferating. They do not express KI67 or PCNA. And there are very few cells within the T cell zone that are proliferating, a few scattered here and there. As in the lymph node, POXP3 is present in the nucleus of CD4 cells, 
which we see here in cyan, but not in CD8 cells, which are present in magenta. And then finally, uh, when we look at the macrophage population within the context of the B cell follicle, again, we see scattered macrophages. They seem to be increased in number, and the expression of PDL1 is much more prominent, and it forms a network-like um, arrangement within that follicle. Uh, again, the CD163 marker of macrophages and dendritic cells is present in the outside the follicle. And many of these cells co-express CD168, uh, but it's not present within the follicle. On to the third tissue. This is the lymphoma. Uh, this is a whole slide image of the lymph node, which is diffusely involved by lymphoma, the lymphoma, which has really um, overrun the normal architectural features of a lymph node. The normal architecture, as you'll recall, is a follicular architecture with B cell follicles and inter interspersed T cell regions. Here you see a few regions of CD20, which uh, indicate perhaps residual follicles. Um, CD4 in white uh, does not show uh, the typical pattern in between the follicles. And what's very prominent is a red hue to this whole tissue section, which comes from the marker PCNA, indicating proliferating cells. At a higher magnification, uh, that becomes even more clear. You see a uniform population of uh, cells, which do express CD20, but the PCNA expression is very, very prominent, hence the red appearance. Virtually all of these cells are in proliferative phase. There are very few T cells, which are in yellow, that you can see at this power. And when we go to one, yet, one magnification higher yet, we can see a few scattered T cells. We can see that this uniform tumor is infiltrating the walls of the blood vessels and, dis, um, and expanding them. Also, these might also be uh, endothelial type of cells in uh, uh, lymphoid endothelial endothelial cells or capsular lining cells, but regardless, this tumor is really infiltrating these cells, um, uh, this, these regions, and the PCNA is very, very prominent, again, uh, consistent with the proliferation of this lymphoma. Now, when we combine the KI67 visualization with PCNA, we find something very interesting. And that is that the KI67 is absent, but the PCNA is very, very prominent. This may indicate a specific location within the cell cycle of the majority of these tumor cells. We see an occasional PD1 positive cell, but these are very rare um, compared to what we have seen in the tonsil in the lymph node. Finally, um, as before, we can identify regions which have scattered T cells. Again, they are further dispersed than we see in the other uh, normal lymphoid tissues. But when we look at FOXP3 regulatory cells, they again are found um, in the CD4 subset of cells rather than the CD8 cytotoxic subset of cells. There are, as we mentioned, a few residual follicular-like structures. Here is one of them. It's interesting that when we stain with CD20 in white, the uh, residual follicles have a brighter CD20 staining to them than do the tumor cells, which are dimly CD20 positive. You see that here down in the lower right-hand corner. And there are, as before, um, residual CD68 um, positive macrophages not very many, and then we have the um, extra follicular CD163 positive, CD68 positive macrophage, macrophages uh, that have lingered within this lymph node. So 
So to summarize then, uh, we can make a visual comparison of all three of these tissues. We have the quiescent lymph node on the left, the reactive tonsil in the middle, and the malignant lymphoma on the right. And what we can see in the lymph node is that follicles are small, they're involuted, um, they are maybe poised to react to antigens but not actively reacting right now. Um, they lack prominent germinal centers, there are few proliferative cells, few macrophages. The T cell zone has um, a relatively speaking sparse number of cells that produces at least the uh, visual impression of high blood vessel density that we had seen. In contrast, the reactive tonsil has expanded follicles. There are many cells, prominent, highly proliferative terminal centers with regular distribution of macrophages. The T cell zone is more densely populated and uh, expanded relative to the lymph node. Um, blood vessels thus appear less dense because of that expansion. And then finally, within the malignant lymphoma, there are really no um, normal follicles uh, that are readily discernible. The tissue architecture is largely effaced by sheets of proliferating lymphoma cells. So that's a qualitative investigation of these three different lymphoid uh, tissue types uh, based on this highly multiplexed uh, panel of stains. Now I want to give you a, a brief introduction to how quantitative investigation can be applied to these data sets. And here I'd like to thank our colleagues from Indica Labs in particular Kim Collins, uh, with whom we have collaborated on the quantitative analysis of Orion data sets using the HALO image analysis platform. In particular, the HyPlex uh, FL module of HALO was used in conjunction with HALO AI for nuclear and tissue segmentation. Let me walk you through the steps uh, that occur here from nuclear segmentation to tissue classification and then ultimately, ultimately multiplexed um, analysis. So what nuclear segmentation is, is an automated system that makes use of the nuclear dye that we have on the section to be able to separate individual cells one from another. We used HALO AI to create a custom nuclear segmentation algorithm for analysis of the tonsillar tissue to actually segment the diversity of nuclei within this sample type. And then ultimately, we applied the segmentation method to the other tissues as well. So here you can see the nuclear segmentation via these um, uh, delineated lines between the nuclei. We then created a HALO AI tissue classifier algorithm and trained it to recognize four different zones in the tonsil. The B cell zone, the T cell zone, the non-lymphoid stroma, and the crypt epithelium. And you can see here the Orion image with the B cell zones, the crypt epithelium, the T cell zones here, and then in the slower image, also having stroma in the bottom left-hand corner. And then you can see how well the tissue classification worked using the HALO AI classifier. So every place where you see a follicle here, you now see this yellow tissue classified follicle for the B cell zones. This epithelial region here is E, and then the T cell region here in green is T, and you can see the similar result that exists in the other um, field of view. So for the phenotypic analysis of tonsil then, we use that tissue classification that you see on the left that was derived from the Orion image that you see next to it. And then we apply the HyPlex FL module and analyze the four tissue class, uh, classes. And this allows the phenotypic analysis to occur 
In this case, we're looking at the follicles, and at a higher magnification, you can see the phenotyping of individual cells within that follicle. And we then applied a similar analytic workflow to the lymph node. Again, here's the Orion image on the far left. And here, this is the Hyplex um, FL analysis of the T cell zones rather than the follicle in this case. And then when you look at the, the higher magnification version of this construction, you can see the individual cells that are colored according to phenotypes that we ask the system to evaluate. And in this particular analysis, the cyan light blue cells are, in fact, uh, um, endothelial cells. These are forming blood vessels, in a sense, that what we have here. The copper cells that you see down here to the left are CD3 positive, CD4 positive cells. And the magenta cells interspersed are some CD20 positive B cells. And then finally, a um, similar approach was taken for the lymphoma. Now, because of the architectural effacement of that lymphoma, really, we just came up with two classifications in this case. Um, you can see the Orion image here with a residual piece of, or bit of follicle, and then uh, the lymphoma surrounding it. So we basically have a lymphoma region and a residual follicle region, and here you can see some of the phenotyping on the individual segmented cells in the follicle here. Once we have all this work done, then we can apply quantitative approaches to at both the tissue classification level and the individual cell level. And what I'm going to give you is just really a little taste of the type of analysis that's possible um, using image analysis methods on the Orion data set. So at first, what I'll show you is that the quantitative analysis of the entire tissue regions uh, reveals that the um, qualitative observations are, in a sense, confirmed. Um, looking at the entire B cell row, uh, regions of the lymph node and the tonsil, making a comparison between these two tissues, um, in terms of square millimeters, you can see the numbers here. We have 28. For the B cell zone in the lymph node, we have 21 in the tonsil. We have 101 in the T cell zone and 55 in the tonsil. Um, this integrates the data across the entire slide rather than just in one region. And then when we take a ratio of this, we find that the ratio of the T cell to the B cell zone is 3.6 in the lymph node and 2.6 in the tonsil. So that ratio has actually decreased in the tonsil relative to the lymph node by about 27%, which confirms the qualitative impression that the B cell zone is expanded in the reactive tonsil relative to the quiescent lymph node. What's more, we can look at the percentage of individual cells within the region. You can see that the percentage of B cells staining with CD20 within the B cell region, the follicles of the lymph node in the tonsil is approximately the same. But if you look at the percentage of CD3 positive T cells within the T cell region, we find that in the lymph node it's very high, but in the tonsil it's lower. The suggestion there is that there is a greater percentage of non-T cells within the T cell region of the tonsil than in the lymph node. Uh, we can pursue further analysis. We can ask, what's the CD4 to CD8 ratio of helper to cytotoxic T cells within the T cell region of the lymph node in the tonsil? And we find that it is greater in the lymph node than in the tonsil. So it suggests that there might be you know, uh, uh, a greater component of the helper uh, T cell uh, within the lymph node, helper T cell within the lymph node, um, for reasons that we can speculate on. Perhaps it's because it's primed for immune response. Perhaps it's some other reason. But anyhow, this is the type of analysis that can be done on an individual cell basis 
after application of the segmenting and phenotyping tools. Furthermore, we can ask questions regarding vascularity and checkpoint biomarkers. So in this case, we looked at CD31 positive staining within the B cell region and the T cell regions of the lymph node and the tonsil. What we found is that there was a greater number of CD31 positive cells as a percentage in the T cell regions than there were in the B cell regions of both the lymph node and the tonsil. But that percentage of um, segmented uh, CD31 positive cells uh, in the T cell region of the lymph node was greater than it was in the tonsil. Um, it sort of confirms what our impression was about the cellular, the vascular density within the lymph node relative to the tonsil with greater vascularity in the lymph node. Um, we could derive an H score, which is a way of combining the intensity of the staining on each cell and the extent of staining across the total number of cells um, by using this segmented phenotypic analysis. And uh, when we do this, we get similar results that occur with vascular H score as we did with the percentages. Using the H scores, we could evaluate the checkpoint markers PDL1 and PD1. Both of these were expressed at higher levels in the lymph node than in the tonsil. So in general, uh, this is consistent with active immune response to the tonsil and absence of immune response, um, uh, at least current in the lymph node. And as we mentioned earlier, complex phenotypes can also be investigated. Um, we have many markers worth of information, so we can ask questions about combinations of phenotypes after we've segmented the cells. So here, analysis of the T regulatory marker FOXP3 reveals that the majority of FOXP3 positive cells are CD4 positive cells as opposed to CD8 positive cells. Um, in addition, the lymph node has fewer FOXP3 positive PD1 positive cells than uh, the tonsil does, regardless of whether they're CD4 positive or CD8 positive. So in this case, what we've looked at here is a combination of three different markers. PDL1 expression is present on both the CD68 positive and CD163 population of macrophages, but as you can see, um, it is um, at present at higher amounts in the B cell region in the CD68 population. Um, and in general, the expression in the tonsil is quite a bit higher than it is in the lymph node. I'd like to thank my colleagues at RareSight who have made uh, uh, major contributions to the work that's been presented here. And I'd also like to thank Indica Labs for the work that they have done uh, in the quantitative analysis, um, primarily Kim Collins, who is on the call now. And so if there are questions regarding Indica, we will have opportunity to answer some of those questions. I'd like to thank you for your attendance here. Hope that this uh, presentation has been interesting and informative and has allowed you to understand the capability uh, of the Orion platform and the potential that multiplex imaging has for your research. Um, I would now be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaljan. We've had quite a number of questions come in. Here is the first one to you from Alex. Could you show the extent of autofluorescence in the tissue section? Well, autofluorescence turns out to be a very interesting uh, phenomenon, um, particularly within the, uh, uh, the Orion platform. As I'm sure you know, it has been a real bugaboo of, of uh, immunofluorescence for for a long time. The Orion system 
has a way to be able to identify autofluorescence and actually isolate autofluorescence uh, and reduce it within the background overall of the tissue section. And what's more, it can take that autofluorescence and actually isolate it as a separate color. We haven't shown that to you here, but you can actually make use of autofluorescence of different sorts as a way to identify matrix components and other uh, aspects of a tissue as long as you know what those are. So we actually try to make some lemonades out of the lemons there and uh, remove it. It still exists. Um, we have been successful in reducing it to very low levels in, um, uh, in the Orion platform. And what's more, we can isolate it and use it as an individual marker uh, without using an antibody. Ah, all right. Our next question is also for you from Giorgio. Do you provide custom in-house conjugation? Yes, we provide um, panels that are customizable. Uh, we currently are developing panels for various customers. Uh, our plan is to have off-the-shelf um, available uh, uh, kits that have that are in a sense modular for different applications. Our primary ones early on are immuno-oncology. Uh, we uh, also uh, perform conjugations in-house, and if you'd like to learn more about that, you can let us know. I believe that we have plans for um, for conjugation kits also, so others can perform the conjugations, but uh, that should be confirmed by some of my other colleagues. Thank you. The next question is from Alex. What is the highest possible magnification? We do our scanning using a high numerical aperture 20x objective. That's what allows us to generate the images that you see here. Uh, we have additional objectives that are possible to put onto the machine. So you could look at 40x um, objectives. It turns out that the 20x objectives work remarkably well. Um, the improvement in 40x, um, I understand, is not that much over our 20x objective. Um, if your question regards can you do uh, oil immersion or other types of analyses at even higher, um, my uh, gut feeling is all of this is possible. Um, it's not our standard application right now, but I can certainly see why you may be interested in doing this, and I think that's worth the conversation also. All right, and we have a series of questions from Lars. I'll ask them one at a time so you don't have to try to remember them all. The first question is, what objective lens is used? Yeah, this one is that um, uh, 20x, uh, uh, I believe it's a uh, 0.75 numerical aperture uh, lens for the scanning. All right. His second question, are secondary ABs used? So that's an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. In uh, One of the remarkable things about these panels is that uh, virtually all the antibodies here you see are directly conjugated antibodies. It makes the staining process um, simple, but it also shows how important it is to reduce background in order to be able to get these kinds of signals that I'm showing you. Um, we do have the capability to use a secondary antibody for amplification. Um, in um, some of the, uh, I can't tell you for sure in this panel, but I think one, possibly two, of the antibodies in this panel have a haptonated um, primary and a secondary that comes after it. Um, it uh, so that is possible. The total number of amplifiable antibodies will be a handful relative to the remaining uh, directly, directly conjugated ones. All right. His third question, are the exposure times fully automated? That is a good question, and I'm going to have to refer to some of my colleagues on that. So we'd like to take that down, um, and my hunch is 
that virtually everything here is automated. Um, I don't know exactly what the um, capability is for um, manual adjustment of the exposure times, but uh, we'll get back to you on that with that information. All right. And his final question, are the antibody panels fixed or can they be customized? Well, they definitely can be customized. Uh, we recognize that everyone has uh, his or her favorite biomarkers uh, based on research interests. We also recognize that within immunology, immuno-oncology, there are a number of, of uh, phenotypic markers that will be of general interest. So we will combine uh, both standardized panels with flexibility for generation of your own um, customized uh, markers. All right. Our next question is from Nicholas. Can this technology be used to look at live cells that have been smeared onto a slide? So, uh, it's an interesting question. They could, it can certainly be used to look at slide smears. Now, if you mean, um, I mean, typically when a slide smear is made, the, the cells will die. If you mean cells that are in a slide well, that are still in fluid, uh, I have to say that currently we do not have the kind of stage that would allow, allow that type of analysis. But as is true with anything, um, I'm sure it could be engineered if there were the rationale for it. All right, and he had a follow-up question for that. Once the cells of interest are identified, might it be possible to retrieve them? Yeah, so that's also an interesting question. Um, as some of you may know, our site finder uh, application for um, both uh, liquid biopsies and also up to six channel tissue biopsies has a module inside of it that we call the site picker. That can go down to tissues and isolate micro regions of maybe five to 10 or 15 cells based on the phenotype. Um, there has um, uh, been uh, a lot of interest in being able to do this for DNA and RNA sequencing. We have some papers in, uh, in um, submission right now, and we've put out posters at AACR and other places that demonstrate RNA sequencing from tissues based on the um, uh, phenotypic uh, analyses that we did uh, on um, using six-color immunofluorescence. Um, there is, uh, we ha will have ways to be able to transport tissues from Orion coordinates to site finder coordinates to be able to do that type of tissue picking. Um, it will probably be a second instrument um, as opposed to including the site picker on the Orion instrument since our feeling is that the value of the Orion instrument is going to be in this highly multiplexed imaging, and you probably don't want to use up that kind of uh, scan time with the picking, but you could transfer this over. The other possibility is that you could take a serial section and then using architectural features, you can find the area that you want to based on the phenotypes, and then you could uh, pick those regions on the site matter instrument. Ah, all right. Next is a series of questions from how you. The first one, are there physically 21 fluorescence channels options in the Orion instrument? Uh, we do have uh, 21 fluorescence channel options on the Orion instrument. Um, yes, we do. All right. Followed by, what is the spectrum range that can be detected? Um, uh, it, it generally covers everything that you can imagine in terms of available dyes within the spectrum. It's a technical question that's a little beyond my expertise, but if you send us a question, we will give you an answer um, uh, via email. All right. And just as a reminder to our attendees, I will be sending all these questions along to Eric, and that way he'll have a list of all the questions you asked so that you can get your answers. The follow-up okay, question... Great. Excellent. The next question, are all 21 fluorescence channels scanned simultaneously? Yes, they are all scanned simultaneously. Followed the staining, by, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, the staining is also done in a single process. And what that means is that the entire slide is stained all at once, 
after it's stained, then it's scanned all at once. We do not use any iterative or cyclic process. Part of, of this was very intentional. As you may know, when if you use a an iterative process, it not only takes time, but it has other issues regarding registration, and maybe even more importantly, if you have to, in a sense, erase the stain each time, it can have an effect on the antigenic preservation of the epitopes that the markers, uh, that the antibodies are used to identify the markers. So those were specifically things that we wanted to be able to design out. We wanted to be able to preserve the antigens, we wanted to simplify the staining process, and increase the speed of the scanning. All right, and the final question, what kind of fluorescence dyes are used in the 17 plex studies? Again, this is a question that really our um, engineers um, uh, will be better suited for for answering, but uh, they are many of the, the, the dyes that are currently uh, available, and we can give you a general answer to that question. All right. This question is from Megan. Are there antibody panels for either human or mouse tissue? Another great question. We are beginning with antibody panels for humans, but we have plans to expand these to uh, mouse tissues for um, the obvious interest in doing um, uh, in vivo work in model systems. Our next question is from Marion, and it is, can you perform an H and E stain on the same tissue section you stained with Orion? That's one of the really neat things about this, and I have to say that as a pathologist, I find this particularly um, remarkable and interesting. After the Orion imaging is completed, the tissue section can be uh, uh, decover slipped, then it can be stained with H and E, re-imaged again, and then that image can be um, uh, basically registered with the Orion image. And in fact, um, in fact, I will just go back to uh, the very beginning section that I showed uh, on multiplex imaging. Um, this here, let me show you this. This is an H and E image, and the image that I showed you just before this of this multicolored stain is actually an overlay on the H and E that was performed after the Orion imaging. So when I showed you that that's a B cell, that's the actual cell there. That is not a serial section. That's the actual cell. And our, um, as you can imagine, our um, uh, the plans are to develop software tools that will allow um, a reviewer to look at an H and E like this and then ask, oh, what's that cell, what's this cell, what's this cell, and then click on the Orion part of that module and then be able to see what the staining is. And therefore, you can be able to go back and forth between morphologic assessments and phenotypic biomarker assessments um, activation state assessments of the cells. And we can imagine this is going to be a tremendous tool to be able to do observations in real time on the fly, and then from that to develop hypotheses that then can be tested in further studies. All right. We have time for just one or two more questions. The next one from Ravi. Are there diagnostic applications of Orion imaging? You know, that's a great question, too. I have to say that right now, Orion is a research use only platform. But uh, as you can imagine, uh, as has been recently published, uh, multiplexed imaging um, that allows deeper phenotyping of immune responses in uh, patients receiving immunotherapies, uh, I think is going to be increasingly demonstrated to be uh, able to derive signature markers based on the multiplexed imaging 
that will discriminate better between responders and non-responders. And once that is shown, then it's just, you know, a hop, skip, and a jump to making that into a diagnostic test because, as we know, uh, in, you know, immune checkpoint inhibitors can have phenomenal effects on those patients that respond, but 60, 70 percent of patients still may not respond, and they deserve other therapies uh, rather than those. Um, Another potential application has to do with samples that just don't have very much material. If you only have one or two slides worth of diagnostic material, you can't really run a 10 or 12 um, uh, uh, panel IHC set on those to be able to do ordinary diagnostics. Um, on the other hand, you could easily run a 10 or 12 um, uh, panel Orion assessment and, in a sense, be able to squeeze out 10 or 12 different IHC slides out of a single sample. So I think you're going to end up seeing diagnostic applications of various types um, using, uh, using Orion. All right. And we have time for just one more short answer, so I've picked a short question. Does Orion come with image analysis tools built in? Yeah. Uh, the um, Orion has a, uh, a user interface. Uh, the Artemis software that allows uh, a rapid um, evaluation of the uh, um, overall scan that you get. Um, it has, as you saw from uh, the work with HALO, the capability to export these uh, images and use third-party softwares for uh, software for being able to do more in-depth uh, types of analysis. Uh, we will develop increasing levels of tools to be able to make that analysis as seamless as possible over time. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. We have reached the end of our time. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenter for, day, for today, Dr. Eric Kaljan, to thank RareSight for sponsoring today's web symposium. Finally, I would like to thank you all so very much for attending. We know you're very busy. And we live in strange times, so we're grateful that you chose to spend this time with us. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia series, thank you again so very much. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.